All right, so good morning. Is everybody able to see the, the screen I'm sharing or is it blank? You can see Looks it. Good. Okay, great. Often, I usually get a little border around this month, uh, the screen, I'm not seeing it. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Eric Broden. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. And I um, want to welcome you to our, I think this is our fourth large group meeting of this group. Um, I'm going to go over a quick agenda for today. Um, we do a pretty packed agenda. Um, we're scheduled to go through 1130. I'm going to go through a brief review of our timeline so far. Um, I'm going to go through a very quick introduction to data collection as I've had it explained to me by um, various stakeholders, including law enforcement agencies and um, our customer contacts at the state. I'm really excited for um, a panel we're going to be hosting here with um, these four guests coming from the town of Mead, Denver Police Department, um, Colorado State Patrol and the Westminster Police Department. Um, I'm going to start that off with a couple of question, questions or two, but I really want to make sure it's an opportunity for everyone here to be able to interact. So please join with that. And then I'm really pleased to have guests from Stolfus and Associates and the Colorado Department of Transportation to go over um, some of the work that's being done with the Crash Manual Task Force updates. And finally, I will kind of round us off with some next steps of the, of the consortium. Um, before I move on, though, um, since we are going to be having kind of a question and answer session here with our panelists, if folks are able to add their affiliation to their their names in their um, so add your name, just make a comma or a hyphen and your organization, um, that's really helpful for us and for the panelists to be able to know who that we're engaging with. And when we get to that point, please feel free to um, use your, your cameras as well if you're comfortable. So going to our timeline, we are getting towards the tail end of this two-year um, project that we have. This, As a reminder, this is a project that's been funded by a 405C Traffic Records Improvement Grant from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We've had several meetings um, in, tw in 2020, fiscal year 2023. Um, in 2024, we've done surveys, we've done interviews with over 60, 60 to 70 um, individuals representing over 100 organizations. Um, we published an inventory and needs assessment based off these conversations. And we are in a phase now. We're really looking to develop and implement some solutions. Um, we're at our June 20th meeting. We are planning mm -hmm. another meeting um, to kind of wrap this section, this grant period up in September. And once that date is confirmed, we will send that out. We're working on a little end of year survey that we can send out, we would want to send out, and drafting a in the process of drafting a final report, which will include uh, specific outcomes, recommendations, and next steps addressing the primary goals of this program, which has really been to investigate the needs of the region um, and work to solve common issues of crash data collection, processing, and analysis. Today, our meeting is really going to have a law enforcement focus and uh, dig into a deep dive kind of into the crash reporting process and what goes into that. Um, previous meetings of this group um, have largely focused around data processing um, and analysis, but mostly on processing. We've had really great, um, and i I feel informational um, presentations from our colleagues at the Colorado Department of Revenue, um, Department of Transportation, other folks here at, at Dr. Cog who have gone through um, all the steps that go into creating the data, data product that's used by many of you after it's been received by DOR. And so with that in mind, and also wanting to respond to some of the feedback we received at our last meeting, um, a couple of questions we had were about what are some officer opinions on difficulties in data collection and reporting, and a question about what are some of the top items in the crash form that get cleaned on the back end or corrected, and could there be efforts to work with local police departments on those? And to that, I say I, I would say yes, and I think that our colleagues at the state have really done a great job on that, leading that, um, working with specific agencies to identify where sometimes there are even issues where data is being collected and it's high quality, but there's a transmission issue. And so there's been that conversation going on at the state level. Um, and so I think that's something that we can really hopefully be a part of as well. As far as the data collection, there are different policies that different you know, law enforcement, and all this is again, based off of the conversations that I've had um, with agencies in the region and this throughout the state. Um, but there's different policies that agencies have, but there's a general path for the way that data flows through um, 
police departments and, and agencies as they go to um, the state. There is a standard form, and we might refer to that throughout this, but it's called the DR-3447. If you don't remember that, I think that's okay. Typically, we'll call it the crash report or police report. Um, and there's certain fields on that form that are required. It's a standardized form, but there are different ways that it can be completed. Um, there are software systems out there called records management systems that, that law enforcement agencies use that really connect to all different aspects within their organizations, often including citation, um, arrest information, but crash reporting is, a, is an important part of that. And often what we've found is through this process is that they sort of, even though there's a standard form, they often will walk the investigating officer or trooper through filling out the form in different ways or have different defaults to them. So that's something I think is really even illuminating to me and something that I think we wanna learn more about. Some important elements to the crash report that many of you may be familiar with, but maybe not all um, are some of these, of course, there's much more than this, but these are a few I wanted to highlight. Um, first and foremost, we're gonna have the occupant or non-motorist information. Um, this will often include things like the name, um, insurance information, things that are the date and time of, of a crash, these are important for the states to be able to link uh, the crash reports to the drivers or other other individuals um, drivers records at the Department of Revenue. And then there's also information that is used in the traffic safety world in the law enforcement realm um, and in other other asp other realms, um, including location, which can include perhaps latitude, longitude, um, intersection offset distance, uh, mile marker and offset distance to determine where these are happening. Things such as driver, motorist, contributing factors and actions. Um, contributing factors are things such as asleep or fatigued, um, driver mostly upset, um, distracted driving, um, or and there's different ones that, that for motorists and some that are specifically apply for non-motorists, but many, there's a lot of overlap in there. And actions are things such as a, a failed to yield a right away, um, improper passing, um, things that or the officer's opinion as they're filling it out. The harmful event sequence is used to determine the crash type um, at CDOT um, to use in their analysis and what's then goes through to be able to use on our data we put out. Um, sometimes the first harmful events in the sequence isn't the most harmful. It's kind of a, there's a lot, a lot going on there, but it is, that's kind of why this report is so interesting and so important because there's so much information that's collected on this. Um, the impairments being suspected is another important aspect we I've heard about a lot, um, whether it's drugs, alcohol, or other drugs, alcohol, marijuana, other um, narrative is an opportunity on the form for mm -hmm. law enforcement to provide kind of a mechanistic um, description of what's happening, which gives a location, gives some of the events that led up to the crash. Um, it's not supposed to include things such as names or other person, uh, personal identifiable information. Um, and a diagram is kind of another final point here that is a little bit different than the rest because it doesn't go in the actual report um, since the report, in, in the tabular data that can be accessed by CDOT or through folks that can access from CDOT down the line because it's not a, a text or a num number field, um, but it is something that's often collected especially it's required for things such as fatal crashes or crashes involving trains. There's a few other categories, but it's an element that I've heard about a lot. And so I wanna make sure that um, it's on people's radar as we go forward in this conversation. The, there is a specific timeline in which a report is to be filled out and completed. Um, and that is within five days of the end of a crash investigation. So this kind of has some interesting implications because if it's a very minor crash, um, if it's property damage only, if there's nobody injured, it's possible that an investigation of this sort of crash could be done the same day um, and multiple could be done in a single day by an officer or a trooper. But for more serious crashes that are more complicated or maybe that include um, a fatal injury, um, they could take months to fully investigate. And so it can take a while for that crash data, that information to be sent from the agency to the state. It's not necessarily as simple as getting a report to the states within five days of the events of a crash. That said, there is a mechanism called a fatal blotter where that is sort of, a, it's, it's not a full report of a crash, but it is 
an uh, kind of a memo style um, information of a crash that is sent on to the Department of um, Department of Transportation, and so that they are aware of these more quickly and they have access to the information before having to get the, everything investigated completely. And what I have here is just a very general steps of um, a timeline and how most reports are, are being sent into the states and how this reaction is going down. This doesn't mean that this is the way that all will go down. Um, some of these are pretty standard, but typically they're going to be a crash is going to be notified or law enforcement or others or emergency responders will be notified by a crash through one of the uh, one of the dispatch centers in the region. Um, it's possible this isn't a step because they could observe something happening or they could be notified of it by another one of their colleagues. But this is this is typically how they find this information out. Um, there's the law enforcement or other emergency response. Um, this is the actually showing up on, on the scene and being there to interact with the, those involved with the crash, um, catalog and detail what's going on. Um, this is a really critical phase and it's can potentially be a very dangerous phase. And so it's important to be mindful of that. There's a whole field called um, tra traffic incident management that kind of gets into the mechanics of responding to crashes, um, trying to set set up, block, potentially setting up blocker vehicles um, to keep officers, to keep emergency responders safe, um, to keep those involved safe, and to be able to clear the scene as quickly as possible without compromising the, the investigation or causing a secondary crash, um, which is something that can happen as I'm sure many have observed driving past um, crashes before. The investigation, again, it depends on the length of the kind of the severity or detail of what's going on. If it's a proper, if it's a minor crash, a fender bender, this is a very quick investigation typically, and the report can be turned around pretty quickly. If it's more involved, potentially if there's fatal or other serious injuries, a lot of complicating factors, um, this can take a lot longer. And there's different ways that different agencies can go about this. But once the once the investigation is complete, the, the law enforcement will submit the DR three four four seven crash report um, to <coughs> an officer, or like a supervisor, or a second level in their organization. Almost always, they're reviewed um, for completeness to make sure that they are of Good quality. They can't check, of course, for the accuracy because they're not involved, but making sure that the, the information is complete enough to be sent to the DOR. Once this review is done, that's sent to DOR, and there are some automatic checks that happen on certain fields for completeness, but also their staff will look through reports and try to make sure that the relevant information is captured, that there's enough information there for the record, um, for Make, make, they make sure that it's useful for folks. And if it's determined that this that report is not um, complete enough, um, it will be sent back to the law enforcement agency. And they mm -hmm. have the opportunity then to amend the report and make sure that that's complete. And so that record is sent on to the state. And that is, again, there's different ways, there's different policies that agencies have, um, especially relating to the, res the dispatch response investigation. But in, in general, what I've learned um, is that kind of the rest of this process is pretty standard. And um, there, there is a possibility that information can come out later that will trigger, trigger an amended report. Um, but that's not always, not always the case and it's not always done, but that's why since that, but there is an opportunity sometimes for information to come out and reports to be amended much later after the fact as well. This was this was kind of just intended to be a real brief primer to make sure that everyone is kind of on the same page. I'm I'm not the expert in this. I'm really pleased that we have some experts here with us. Um, so we're going to go over into that portion of our meeting today. And so I'm really pleased to um, present this panel with you. I have some guests that we have from around the region who are really going to be able to speak to some of these things, um, speak to some of the challenges that they experience, but also some of the uh, opportunities that they have, some, some of the things that are working well in this realm to get that data collected. Um, and first, first of all, I want to introduce um, Chief Newbanks from the town of Mead. Um, we have Sergeant Farr from the Denver Police Department. 
Sergeant Simpson from the Colorado State Patrol and Sergeant Wilbur from the Westminster Police Department. And so if the four of you would, if you're able to share your camera, that would be really great just so folks can see who we're talking to. And real briefly, um, and maybe I wanna start with you, um, Chief, if you can just give a real quick um, introduction and we'll go, go around the room. Sure. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it, Eric. Um, it's good to be here today. And I uh, just a um, little bit about uh, obviously Mead is a, the obviously <laughs> by far the smallest uh, agency of the ones represented here today, but we do lie uh, right on the I-25 corridor. And so uh, we should see our share of crashes and we're the last section to get um the widening. So we're currently the choke point for about the next three years. And so we anticipate uh, a lot of issues along traffic flow and, and with crashes. So uh, for us, uh, being able to complete crashes as quickly as possible and um, get officers on to the next uh, call for service is imperative. Um, we're currently using Carfax um, as our method of entry, um, but we're hoping that maybe uh, through some of this coordination, we would see uh, maybe a, a method of entry that is consistent among agencies, maybe something that we could share with State Patrol because of our frequent interactions with them, where we might be able to show up on scene, get people started um, with uh, some form of entry, and then uh, speed up the process if we can, um, but also uh, make the uh, data more uh, consistent uh, from officer to officer, agency to agency. So thank you for uh, including me today. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Um, Sergeant Farr. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sergeant Mike Farr. I've been a Denver police officer since 1988, was promoted to sergeant in 95, and then moved to the traffic investigations unit in 1999. So I've been in this position now for a little over 25 years. Uh, the traffic investigations unit is in charge of the fatal and serious injury crash investigations. Uh, we also have detectives assigned to our unit who do the follow up on all the hit and run crashes or any incomplete reports that patrol would uh, complete and submit for follow up. We're in charge of filing the, the uh, felony DUI if there's uh, any felons that uh, need to be presented to the DA and any other of the high misdemeanor or felony traffic. If uh, you're familiar with the VCU unit of the Colorado State Patrol, we're very similar in our function to uh, to what they do. But rather than uh, being on patrol constantly, we're uh, a investigative unit in an office and we are called out to the crash scene. So we do respond to the crash scenes that we're in charge of. Um, we use the uh, uh, Versa term is the vendor of the records management system that we currently use. And as part of the uh, time that I've been in here, I've worked with both the Department of Revenue and STRAC in uh, developing the, the crash report form as it now appears, uh, having won some battles in those discussions, having lost some. And uh, so I, I can take only partial credit for uh, what we have and what we produce now. Um, we do have uh, uh, probably a, a fair amount of the crash reports that are uh, completed and sent to the state. I don't have that exact number, but uh, year to date, we're at about uh, 8,000 crash reports overall. So if you take that as a, a quarterly number and probably multiply by four, that will tell you approximately how many crash reports over the course of the year we, we produce. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, let's go, um, Sergeant Simpson. Oh, I believe you're muted. There we go, that's better. Perfect. Hi, uh, Chris Simpson from the State Patrol. I've uh, been been on the patrol about 17 years uh, and now sergeant over policy and research and uh, been here about seven months. So that's, that's about all I got for you. Okay, perfect. And Sergeant Wilbur. Hi, I'm Sergeant Wilbur, West, Westminster PD. I'm currently assigned to the traffic unit, one of two supervisors on it. Our traffic unit's pretty robust. We have both uh, motor unit, car unit, and we have civilian accident investigators. All right, it's great. Thank you. Um, I guess the first thing that I'm going to, yeah, like I said, I think I'm going to ask a couple questions and then I'm going to let 
the group because I'm sure there's a lot of questions out there. Um, one thing that I've heard a lot about in the process of talking with stakeholders is really about the location and how location is captured on reports. And just individually, if you um, maybe start, maybe starting with um, with you, Chief Newbanks, um, how is location typically captured on your police reports? Are they captured on like a latitude and longitude on scene, or are there other other methods that are typically more e easier, more more useful? What's kind of the general policy? Yeah, so for us uh, using uh, the Carfax, um, you can pull in latitude longitude. Um, that is obviously based off of typically based off of where the officer's car is sitting. Um, if they pull that information, um, they uh, and then uh, so much more frequently, really, those reports are based off of a, a mile marker. Um, if it's a state highway 66 or I-25, um, and if it's a, a county road, probably the 100 block. Uh, and that's typically pulled from CAD. So um, those um, those locations could really be pulled from three or four different ways. And uh, consistency in that is is probably something that, that could be improved on our end. Um, we we don't see a lot of issues with it. I mean, typically you're dealing with either an intersection or, um, you know, mile marker is is pretty close. And then obviously, if it's a fatal or something like that, we, we're pulling GPS uh, to to mark uh, specific, much more specific. But on just your typical uh, non-injury crashes, um, there's probably, like I said, three or four different ways that might be pulled. And so. Uh, consistency could be an issue there. Although I don't think we're seeing um, seeing anything in our data that, that would really um, lead us to, to make drastic changes to where we would want to go with a very specific um, GPS point for all crashes. Um, but uh, but that is something that, that we could look at and, and do. Um, but if, uh, if we were going to do that, I, I, I think the recommendation would be that we come up with a uh, consistent system of doing it every time so that um, across the officer to officer agency to agency that would be consistent. Okay. Great. Um, Sergeant Farr? So I can take a really deep, deep dive into this or I can be pretty superficial and it's hard to understand the, uh, you know, what the audience wants. So I'm going to uh, start talking and if I uh, go way too deep, uh, flag me off. But okay. Uh, to begin talking about locations, you got to understand there are different types of locations, meaning, as uh, the chief said, you've got intersection crashes, you've got crashes that occur on the interstate highway system. In Denver, we've got mid block crashes because that's uh, basically what we are. We're part of the grid system for residential and business streets. We have alleyways that are uh, maintained by uh, local government. So those are going to be public ways. And then you've got private property. So that gives us basically five different location types. And each one of those is going to cause the location of the crash to be entered differently. And so uh, our training in the academy starts with that. And we uh, try to enforce that with the, the approval of the reports in that given your location type, the ad, how you address that, that report tells me a lot. I can just look at the location and know whether if you've done it correctly, that a crash occurred in an intersection, uh, away from an intersection mid-block, in an alley or on the interstate highway, et cetera. So with us, it begins with the intersection crash, and it uh, is specific to if you have a violator or you have a proximate cause of that crash, who are you going to write the ticket to? That's the first street that appears on the report. And then the uh, other involved parties, that's the secondary street. So the order in which the streets I list on the report have meaning. And then I go on from there to the mid-block crash. So the uh, crash report for the mid-block crash will have the 100 block of a particular street. And then I will have a number of feet or miles away from a, a cross street. So that way I can tell you it was on uh, 38th Avenue, 20 feet east of Play Street. And then again, I can send you precisely to that location. If you were to walk out there five days later, using that information, you could find it. But we also have now major thoroughfares that are part of the state highway system. So they have not only a name like Federal Boulevard or Colorado Boulevard, but they also turn out to be State Highway 2 or 285 or 287. And so there's a, uh, an even deeper dive for that. So 
I will list the crash having occurred on Colorado Boulevard at Colfax. And if my uh, person I'm writing the ticket to is the person on Colorado Boulevard, it also is listed as a state highway, Highway 2. And then I can put the uh, mile marker where that's at. All that to say, in addition to that, our Versaterm system, when I address it correctly, has uh, the ability to look at the latitude and longitude, and that information is pre-filled for me. So the officers, if you get a, a state uh, crash report from Denver and it's got a latitude longitude, an officer has not determined that, put that in there. That's been determined by the records management system based on the location that I have provided. And all those will be fairly accurate uh, until we get to the private property crash, which Department of Revenue or CDOT usually doesn't worry about private property crashes. But in that case, it will probably just use the latitude and longitude of the parcel address that I'm using when I, I address that report. So uh, okay. all that long-winded uh, uh, explanation to say, we rely a large part on the officers to properly interpret the uh, location type uh, address it correctly based on that, and then let the computer worry about latitude and longitude based on the information that they've entered. Okay, um, thanks. I do see a question in the chat. I know Alyssa had her hand up. Um, Alyssa, do you want to do you want the floor for a moment? Uh, yeah. Uh, the the offset question can be asked after, since it's it's more of a how is it noted. Um, I was told, and I can't remember who told me this, that DPD, uh, a lot of their crashes, their GPS is assigned by dispatch. So like the GPS will say 6th and I-25, but then when we go in and read the narrative, we realize that it's actually half a mile north of that. Um, and so I'm wondering, is there an opportunity to maybe look at it, I'm not sure what my question is because I'm just noticing that there's a difference in like what I was told versus what you're saying. Um, and I, I do think that it's generally pretty accurate for um, like the grid system. It's really on the highways that we notice a difference. And when we get into like, like you say, serious injuries and fatalities, uh, we really rely on that GPS to help us relate it to all the assets and things. Well, uh, I can uh, address that, and I'll tell you the uh, the reason for that is a uh, uh, technology reason that the officer has no control over. So on the interstate highway system, um, let me step backwards one step and tell you that Versaterm is a Canadian product. So the Canadians decided how we were going to address our intersection types or and our uh, our interstate types, and what they decided was an interstate will be treated like an intersection. So that is... If I have a crash that's on I-25, um, it doesn't recognize that I-25 is a uh, highway that starts in uh, New Mexico and goes all the way to Montana. It just knows it's a street somewhere in Denver. And so it's looking for a cross street. It was not programmed to allow me to provide a highway mile marker to I-25. Hmm. Therefore, what we do uh, with addressing our interstate highway uh, uh, crashes is treat them like an intersection which we all know they are not because there's there's no on I-25 and wait for cross traffic to go by. Uh, we have uh, those cross streets are built on a different grade. So it goes below me or above me while I continue to travel on I-25. But what the programmers decided was if you have a crash on the interstate highway system in Denver, where is the nearest cross street? So if I'm on I-25 around 6th Avenue, 6th Avenue will be a cross street. The next one north will be 8th. Uh, the next one north from that uh, may not be until I get up to 13th. I can use any one of those locations on my crash report form to say this crash occurred at I-25 intersecting with 6th Avenue. Then it's up to me as an officer to decide the pinpoint on that crash is how far away from that cross street. We usually use miles on the inter interstate uh, highway system. So it should be one quarter mile or 2,850 2, feet north of sixth avenue on i-25 and that's probably why you're getting data that doesn't seem correct if the gps data is saying okay it's at i-25 and six but that's incorrect because it actually occurred a quarter mile north if you then have the ability to look at the officer's adjustment that is it was now yeah feet north of sixth avenue so that relies on two things now the officer actually putting that location north of sixth avenue 
and the supervisor looking at it, making sure it's there before he approves the report. Otherwise, without that information, it looks like it happened at I-25 right at 6th Avenue when that's not necessarily. Yeah. Right. That is fascinating. Thank you so much for that. If you would like help arguing with Versadex, I would be happy to help. <laughs> That's going to be uh, our information management unit. Uh, I'm just the uh, mechanic guy on the ground. They're the, the halo in the clouds. And so I, I let them do all that arguing. But if you need contact with our information management unit offline, Alyssa, we can do that uh, through email later. Yeah, I've, I've fought Tyler Tech. I ain't scared of no one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> all right. Great. Cool. Awesome. Um, maybe a little bit different since, um, obviously CSP is typically working not on city streets, but, um, Sergeant Simpson, could you just briefly let us know how, again, how location is kind of captured, what processes there are, and what's the kind of the general, um, methodology for that? Yep. So we, uh, our record management system required, well, we programmed it to require a layman location. So you type in interstate 25 or, or whatever road name. Um, and then primarily our crashes are on the interstate. Uh, we do have crashes in individual areas that are on uh, like city streets or un unincorporated roadways. Uh, so we handle both of those, but the way we input them is the officer or the trooper just inputs uh, the location. Uh, if it's interstate 25, they'll type in that and then they're required to put in a mile post and then an offset from that mile post. So the offset can be uh, entered in feet or decimal, uh, decimal of a uh, of a mile. And then uh, same thing with the the, the surface street. So it would be if if it was an intersection, you put in the two roadway names, and then and you can put in the offset of how many feet away from that it is. Uh, we also require the tro our troopers to put in GPS coordinates for for every crash. Uh, and those are those are collected. Typically, we do have a, a program that you can click on your computer that imports the coordinates from where you're at. Uh, but typically, where the trooper is at is not where the crash is. The, the crash has been moved a little bit further down the road or, you know, uh, they've, they've cleared the roadway to open up traffic and they're in a the parking lot half a mile away. So typically that button doesn't doesn't help us. So we we rely on uh, like Google Maps to to zoom in where we're at, take that coordinate, and then put it uh, put it in the the RMS software. Okay, great. Um, and Sergeant Wilbur, with us, Mister. Ours is very similar to the way that Denver does things. Our CAD system, computer aided dispatch, automatically generates the longitude latitude. That's not controllable by us. But that goes in all the reports, and then each individual officer and in our traffic unit takes a vast majority of the crashes. They get the specific location of the crash as well as an accurate offset distance from whatever intersection we're close to since we're a more condensed city not very many wide open spaces the vast majority of the time we're able to get a pretty pinpoint location on where it happened so your your gps is going to be wherever the um the system like kind of sends you to versus but but the location like how you describe the location is going to be accurate Correct. The most accurate is how the officer describes it. The GPS okay. will use an example of a uh, intersection, 104th and Sheridan Boulevard. So when dispatch sure. gets that call, they generate the call for that area. That's what the GPS is. Once the officers arrive on scene and they say, well, actually, we're just west of the intersection. Um, the vast majority of the time, our dispatch is updating that location along with the GPS to move that incident to just west okay. of the location. So it's a little more accurate, but it's not pinpoint. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and which record management system do you use? We use Central Square. Central Square. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I do have a question. See a question. Um, I know Alyssa had one, but maybe we'll get to that in a bit. But when an offset says nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine FS, what does that mean? Um, I don't know who wants to take that. I assume that's probably I can uh, answer a, that. A, 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 just a transmission error or a null. Okay, let's see. Yeah, you're probably the best to do it, actually. No, so it is it is a it is a number that we use to say we don't know. So when we get a generic block number, um, and we don't know how far back from the intercept, like 
let's say like Eric, you and I were talking about 38th and uh, Zunai last night. Um, if we get 3,800 Zunai, we don't know if 38th Avenue is the issue or if congestion at 37th Avenue is the issue or if maybe it's a driveway access. So we use 999 to say we don't know where within this block area it is or within this area. Um, we just know that it is related to this area. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, I see uh, Kenneth. Yeah, if you want to go ahead and ask uh, your question. Yeah, so on, say, interstates or other state highways, but in particular, say, I-25, um, sometimes when, you know, looking at the crashes, there seem to be uh, concentrations at each mile marker, uh, which probably isn't, you know, mile markers themselves probably aren't the most, you know, dangerous locations. Um, so is there any rule or kind of rule of thumb when, you know, an officer is simply putting in, it was, say, within, you know, you know that mile marker area or when they get really detailed into that uh, location, like, you know, a thousand feet north versus just, you know, in that, you know, general vicinity. Well, for uh, Denver, we instruct our officers to put the mile marker into the nearest one hundredth of a mile. So um, I wouldn't expect to see just a, uh, a bunch at one mile marker. I would expect to see them along, given their their best guess of the nearest one hundredth. We don't uh, necessarily have them measure it. In some cases they do. But we want to get to the nearest one hundredth in Denver. So yeah, for state patrol, we that's our goal as well. Um, but a lot of the crashes, either we don't know exactly where it happened because they're they're minor fender benders that someone crashed into each other and then they they pulled off the road a mile, half a mile up ahead, whatever it is, and uh, we're 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 really estimating where that where that crash happened. And typically, instead of just saying you know it happened at the one eight one point two. They'll just say, well, it happened around 181. We don't know for sure. And that that's mainly where those come from from us. I mean, just full full transparency. Some of it's probably people being lazy as well. And just saying, well, 181, it, that, that's good enough. You know, that's a good enough data collection point for us. And we should hammer it down further. Um, but there's a lot of unknowns that go into that as well. Yeah, I'd say that <clears throat> it's exactly what I'm seeing from my officers is um, probably a best guess at maybe a quarter of a mile um, to the mile marker. Um, the other issue is is just uh, even with the laser um, out on the interstate, being able to measure that distance is is pretty difficult. So even even if you know the exact location, being able to get that exact measurement is is oftentimes difficult. GPS much easier if if you can park on it, but um, that's uh, just sort of the the best we can do at this point, I'd say. And Westminster is very similar to everybody else. We have the added coincidental benefit that several of our mile markers are kind of at choke points. So if you do see a concentration in our city, usually it's actually pretty accurate that that's naturally where traffic backs up. We get the rear end crashes, but the officers should be doing the offset distance. And we check that as supervisors when they submit it to make sure that there's something in there. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Alyssa? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you guys had, if you guys know about Otis, which is, um, it's what CDOT uses to, to get their mile markers. Um, it has a full network of, you know, the states, interstates, state highways and all that stuff. Um, if you guys don't know about it, um, I will happily email you guys and show you guys how to use it. Um, and that is an easy and free resource for getting exact mile markers and GPS coordinates and stuff like that. Um, okay, great. Um, Matt, uh, yeah, please, uh, if you have a question, um, go ahead and ask it. Okay. Um, yeah, Matt Duncan, City of Lakewood. So, um, our approach to investigating fatal crashes is um, we work with Lakewood police detectives. Um, so I don't use any type of 
rows and columns of data. Like, you know, we sit at the table, um, put our heads together. And so through that relationship over the last few years, um, one thing that we've learned is that if I were to use DOT data, then in the case of a fatal crash, we're about 130% undercounted. Meaning when I use what I get from Lakewood police, that impairment piece is accurate versus not being on the state level. Um, we've tried to really figure it out. And the ones that are the discrepancy are the death of the offender cases. Um, and so basically with those, at least on the Lakewood police side, because it's not going to go through the judicial process, by the time we get the report back from the coroner, um, you know, it could be like two months later or something. Um, the case has been closed out. And so it, that isn't added as a supplement. Do you guys, do you guys kind of go through the same process? Like, is it, is it a, my understanding is it's like an act of Congress to go in and change a report. Is that across the board with all agencies, I guess, is one question. And then the second, what happens with a coroner's report? Does it just go through the record system? Because um, I guess on our end, that's the fatal flaw, not with law enforcement or engineers, the fatal flaws at the coroner's office isn't included in the data. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with that. And the reason this is so important to me, if that impairment piece is wrong in the DOR data, it's bad data, the whole lot of it. Um, even if the crash location is good, if knowing that someone's under the influence of like a ped was under the influence of methamphetamine, for example, I mean, that's a game changer. So that's why it's real important on my side and why I work with the cops. I'll stop talking there and just let me know what you guys kind of think or see. All right. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in that real quick because uh, Matt's got a, a, a valid point that concerned me a couple of years ago. I thought, you know, we are giving these uh, numbers that we're anywhere from 40 to 60% of our fatal crashes involve uh, intoxication of some sort. And I thought, based on my anecdotal evidence of me investigating a bunch of them, seems higher than that. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon myself to start getting the uh, end of year uh, reports from our decedents. And we don't attend the postmortem of every uh, deceased person. We only attend the postmortems, the autopsies of uh, folks where we believe there's going to be charges or maybe charges as part of our collection of evidence. If I'm not going to present a case in court, we don't make that attend. And so we therefore don't always ask for the autopsy reports to be included in the case. Um, I discovered uh, uh, that uh, we are probably underreporting. And, and I think that uh, is, is certainly true in that my fix for that was to start asking on a quarterly basis from our local uh, 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 medical examiner's office, can I get the impairments that you discovered? And as Matt says, it's probably a 16 week at the earliest endeavor to get those results post crash. So they are definitely delayed reporting. So there's two issues here. The first issue is, did the officer who investigated the crash understand that he saw enough evidence to mark on the report? I suspect somebody was impaired. There are officers out there who have this mistaken belief that I must have scientific evidence to mark that box. Yes, I think someone was drunk or yes, I think someone was high. And that's not true. That's one of the areas of the report where officer opinion is valid. Uh, that opinion has to be based on facts. It can't just be a, a, a wild guess. But if you have the evidence, mark the report. So that gives the uh, folks who are reviewing that report an early indication impairment was involved. Then later down the road, once I get those reports back from the ME, I will go in myself and uh, will for the next 10 working days until I retire July 6th add that information into our system. So if you do a later data pool, you uh, will find that if an officer failed to mark that intoxication, I will not go back and indicate that there was a test and we did find a substance. And so those reports will eventually be updated. Now, if you've done an initial data pool within a month or two, and it takes me now six months to get that in there, yes, there's going to be a disconnect from that data. But um, I am re-entering that information. I now have 2023 entered for the Denver database. Anybody who now asks for intoxication on the part of either a pedestrian, a driver, decedent who was or was not charged, you will now get a uh, definitive answer as to whether impairment was involved in that crash. Nice. Okay. So going in and editing that, do you guys, so again, you know, if it's clearly, let's say a motorcycle, right? You know, he's, you know, triple digit speeds, he crashes. So, I mean, 
you look at the body and you're like, well, speed, speed related, right? So case closed, no one else is involved. Do you guys have, do you close it out or do you leave it open until that corner data comes back then? So in Denver, no, we will close those out at the end of the investigation to get that report to the state as Eric uh, explained earlier. Uh -huh. We have five days from the end of that investigation. Now, um, there are some investigations that go on for months, hit and runs. And I've told officers at some point we need to notify the state of what we know so far. Close that report out long enough to submit a uh, report to the state. And then if you've got work to do, reopen it. And you can do that. We have the ability yeah. in Denver, our investigators can close and reopen cases as necessary. And in Denver, in order to get a report to the state, electronically, we must close it out for two midnights, get that report to the state, what we have and what we know so far. And then we can reopen it. And then anything we add or amend, we mark amended. And now they get the updated report when we finally do close that out. So in the end, no, for uh, a single motorist who even I believe is intoxicated, we do not hold that open until we get the results. When the results come in, we will then add those to the case. And if the report needs to be amended to indicate those, we'll do it at that time. Okay. okay. That makes a lot of sense. And so I'm assuming also, so it, is that something that maybe varies city to city or county to county, or is that like probably? Okay. okay. Again, I I did this on my own volition because I believe we were underreporting it, so it was a decision I made locally. Yeah, very okay. locally. Okay. Yeah, man. No, that makes right. a lot of sense. So, I mean, to me, like on the Lakewood side, it sounds like from them that it's just they're short, they're short staffed. They just it's a it's to go back is so cumbersome. So it seems like the missing piece is the coroner's office or the medical examiner's office because they should have that data. So them being connected to the DOR should prevent those from falling through the cracks, I would assume. That'd be a more realistic approach. Does that sound right? Perhaps. I don't know uh, to what extent their data is available. I get it as a law enforcement officer by request. Gotcha. Uh, anybody who's not a gun and badge wearer, I don't know to what extent they, they get that data, to be quite honest with you. And that's a yeah. question I can't answer. Okay. Yeah, we get it through our police records division is who stays in touch with with them. And that's where I get it secondhand, I guess. So, okay. Yeah, I think, you know, from the city side, again, I, well, I mean, just for Dr. Cog, you know, for you hearing this from me, you know, again, I can't emphasize how important it is that we bring in the medical folks on this. I, and, and, you know, I mean, it's not one crash. When Sergeant Farr is talking about being undercounted. We're 130% undercounted. And I don't know if Carly's in the room, but Carly had been 100%. And really, when we're looking at these pet fatalities, we're coming back at 90% of the deceased are impaired. I mean, and that's nowhere near what DOR is reporting. And it's not that we can't design around it, but it's a total different design. So again, you know, Eric, that's what I'm saying. You get the location right, the time of day, you can have all that right. But if the toxicology comes back and a guy's got 1,100 nanograms per milliliter of methamphetamine in his system, a crosswalk's not going to fix that. So that's my biggest concern and why I do not use DOR data, why I work with our cops. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks for that. Well, well, I um, was going to add for the state patrol, our, our investigators for our VC or vehicular crimes unit go back into those reports and will amend them. Uh, if necessary, when the when the toxicology toxicology comes back, so okay, and that's individual investigators. We don't we don't have a, a sergeant or anybody go in and check up on those. It's it's just up to the individual. Okay, okay. Are you guys also about um, two months actually, behind? I'm sorry. What was that? Do you does it generally take you guys about two months to get those reports back as well? On this yeah, state. yeah. Okay. All, all the toxicology reports right now are are pretty pretty far back. Gotcha. I don't have okay. a date. They're they're a ways back. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. Um, looks like uh Jenny had her hand up. Um, and then we'll go um to Kenneth after. after. We are um planning on wrapping up this section at about eleven as we have some other other guests here. Um, so. Just so everyone's aware, on the time we got about ten minutes left um, for for this part, and also um, some of our guests will be leaving at that point. So, uh, Jenny, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, thanks to the panel. So we've we've heard uh, all the various ways in which location information is collected, um, and some of that does include latitude and longitude. I'm coming back to this. 
Um, so on the data processing side, analysts think about how our work could be reduced by having the precise latitude and longitude that are provided. Um, obviously now the latitude and longitude are not required on the 3447. Um, and I would love to hear perspectives from each of you all on um, what hardships or impacts your organization might encounter if the latitude and longitude ever became required? Great. Uh, maybe you start with uh, Sergeant Wilder. Currently, all our crash reports come through. It's already on there, so making it a requirement wouldn't change anything for us. That's automatically populated. The only challenge would be if you were to narrow in needing it to be exactly precise locations, the onus on that would go through our dispatch center to make sure that they're going in and updating as exact possible location based on the patrol vehicle GPS locations. But currently, all our reports that go through do have longitude and latitude. Denver's built the same way. If uh, I have a uh, crash that happens in a section of town that's new and the uh, computer doesn't understand the intersection and doesn't report the GPS. I can force the GPS data in by clicking on our city GIS map, right click, give me the latitude longitude and I force it into the location. So for Denver, that requirement probably would not be a big deal. Officers would howl like mash cats, but mechanically it could be done. Um, Sergeant? Oh, I think you're gonna mute again. That mute button is tricky. Um, we've we've already instituted this, so there the, there would be no change for us. Right, and Chief. Same with us. It's uh, just a matter of the officer clicking a button, pulling their uh, GPS position, or clicking on the map to get the closest um, approximation. Okay, great. Um, I guess I have another question I could ask, but first, Kenneth, did you have um, another question you wanted to pose before I did? Uh, yes, and it should be a very quick question. Um, you were talking about uh, amending uh, the crash reports once toxicology or autopsy results come in. Um, when those amendments happen, does that change the, the fields on the DR-3447 for officer opinion, or is that somewhere else in the report? Or is that, you know, officer opinion represent what was on scene and does that stay unchanged? If the officer opinion is correct, then nothing has changed. Meaning if he indicated that uh, alcohol was involved or he thought marijuana was involved because the scene evidence told him that, if those results come back and it does show that they were high or drunk, then uh, nothing has changed. But if they, like, um, as you mentioned that some officers don't you know, put in their uh, you know, opinion on the scene, if so if they put in none observed, and they come back, those come back positive, does that get changed? It does if I have control of the report. Okay. Thank I you. don't change all 32,000 reports citywide. I only change those that are under the uh, follow-up of the uh, traffic investigations unit. I was just trying to get a sense. So thank you very much, appreciate it. So just to follow up on that, the we don't change ours at the state patrol for the officer opinion, uh, but we'll note in there that it was that a a toxicology test was was done, but we don't go back and and say, you know, now that we know there's alcohol involved, we don't change our officer opinion to that there was alcohol involved. It's whatever was observed on the scene. And that's what Westminster does as well. We don't change officer opinion. Okay. okay. Um. I guess we're getting kind of close to time. Um, I have a question. If anyone else has any questions, though, I'll just raise your hand and put it in the chat. We might be able to get to that. But I would be curious just to open this up for everybody. Um, what do you experience either yourself or you hear from um, reports about what is challenging about the crash reporting process? And maybe as a two part, if I can get this in here, um, what would you like your non law enforcement colleagues who are on this call with us today to? who use this data for various purposes to know about the process. And maybe, um, maybe start with uh, Sergeant Farr. Sure, one of the uh, uh, heartaches and headaches I have is we're in an electronic system and it should be, if I create a report and it's crap, it should be rejected. And I don't think our validation 
running in the background is robust enough here in Denver to do that. Uh, recently got a report back from uh, the state that basically said there was a crash and that was it. There was no location. There was no narrative. No, uh, How that report got to the state in that condition is a validation error ran and said, well, what I'm looking for uh, isn't wrong. And uh, uh, the fact that it's not there doesn't make it wrong. So let's send it to the state. So my heartache really comes from the technology side is if I've got a report that for whatever reason, a supervisor has failed to see that it's incomplete or it's just flat wrong. Um, the system itself, the validation check that's running in the background does not seem to be robust enough. So I'm going to say that's probably more of a, uh, an issue between our vendor and the state, one that's out of my control. But that's probably where I would uh, have the greatest heartache is I want my validation error to be bit, uh, validation um, to be a bit more robust. Okay. Uh, Chief Newbanks. Yeah, for us, it's, um, I think just getting consistency officer to officer, um, our, our program, or we're using Carfax. So, uh, widely available, um, platform that many small departments use, uh, which does help track officers through filling out a three, four, four, seven, um, and, does produce a fairly complete report in the end. Uh, however, um, getting, you know, again, the consistencies from officer to officer, agency to agency seems to be the uh, constant theme that keeps coming back and getting, uh, you know, we have the same same issues of getting an accurate location um, when cars have already been moved and um, you know, that type of thing. Uh, fatals are different, obviously. Uh, much more investigation goes into that and much more time is spent uh, collecting that information and, and following up on it. But, um, you know, from the day-to-day -day crashes, uh, getting uh, a, an accurate location and, um, and, and just from hearing this, uh, the way GPS is pulled, you know, everything from uh, it being assigned by the the CAD or dispatch at the very beginning to, you, you know, the the officer standing at a point on the highway and and pulling it on the scene. Uh, those are vastly different. So um, I think, you know, just consistency overall, I, I don't know how we we ever get to the point of being consistent and, and pulling this information and, and being able to say that that in the end, when we're trying to evaluate things, um, uh, you know, unless there's a, a state system that's created, which obviously sounds like we're uh, a long ways from from having. Um, but that being said, I, I think uh, these discussions are worth it. And if we get something out of it, maybe it is that we at least have a way of training our officers consistently that they're going out and, and attempting get the same information that everybody else is getting and uh, increases our uh, consistency a little bit. But uh, I think that's, for me, somewhat the frustration. And just, I think it's been said several times is, um, you know, you have some supervisors that are really good at this and, and know what to look for and others that that don't. So stuff does slip through that we would rather not, uh, that we'd rather get caught and sent back. Um, but that's uh, human nature. So keep working on that as well. Thanks. All right, great, thank you. Um, Sergeant Wilbur? As far as the actual entry of the information, um, we really have no concerns. Our argument is outside of the information that's being reported. Our records management system is a little burdensome and not the most user-friendly. So that's the biggest complaint that we have that is absent of the information that we need. With our traffic unit taking usually over 85% of all crashes within our city, um, the people collecting it are experienced. They know what information is needed. They know how to do the report, so it's easy. Okay. And uh, Sergeant Simpson. So I, I think one of the main things is uh, kind of like the chief was saying, uh, data consistency. Um, there, there's a lot of data fields in the DR three four four seven, and some of those are are very difficult to to determine uh, for our officers or for our troopers. Uh, such as the autonomous vehicle information, uh, where where we select a category of autonomy, autonomy and whether they ceded control. Um, but you know, there, there's so many different options on vehicles, and you can buy one vehicle that has you know uh, as much autonomy as as you can buy, and the other would have the bare minimum. Uh, that's very difficult to decide as a as a trooper what 
what level of autonomy that is. And then also when you ask, if, even if you ask the people driving it nine times out of 10, they're, they don't know for sure. Um, so I, data questions like that are very hard for us to, to determine and to fill out correctly. Um, and that's, that's one of the, the main uh, pinch points, I think, for us. Uh, isn't just that, and then the contributing factors, same thing. Is there, there's a lot of different contributing factors that are listed on the DR3447, and a few of those are, are in my opinion, redundant. I, un I understand that you, know, you guys are looking at it from a different vantage point, uh, but when, when I'm trying to determine if someone was distracted, um, I don't know necessarily if they were distracted by their, their electronic device, headphones, passenger, otherwise. Uh, so being specific on those is kind of, it can be difficult at times. Um, and then uh, the contributing factors as well as, as uh, determining if one of the contributing factors was, was due to a person's age versus their inexperience. Um, so a lot of those I think are, are duplicate, but you guys are, are the, the data crushers. So if, if you don't think they're duplicative, then, then so be it. All right. Great. Well, thank you all so much for this really interesting panel. Um, I, I definitely learned a lot, and I hope that our gathered stakeholders here did as well. Um, I do want to, um, again, thank you all for being here um, and agreeing to, to work with us on this important topic and for all the hard work that you and your officers and troopers do every day on this. Um, we do have um, another set of guests who have joined us today. Um, Celine, or sorry, Celeste from Stolfest and Associates, as well as Alyssa from the Colorado Department of Transportation. And so we are going to, I'm going to turn over the sc screen to um, Celeste, in which she is available. All right, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, so Eric, it doesn't let me share until you stop sharing your screen. While we get that going, um, I'm Celeste Shin with Stolfus and Associates. Um, I am a transportation engineer. My background is in roadway design, but I also am part of traffic incident management. I do a lot of that for Northeast Colorado. Um, so I work with a lot of law enforcement partners up there. I am here representing a traffic records coordinator for the STRAC, and I'll let Alyssa introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Um, I am a crash data analyst with CDOT. I work under Dave Swanka in the traffic safety and engineering services branch, which I think is the first time I've said that right since I started. Um, I have been really working a lot uh, I was initially working with the crash data as a contractor, working on the cleaning up process um, and very quickly uh, moved into working with the agencies directly um, and fighting their record management systems with them. So i um, very happy to tell you uh, about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background and I'm going to try to keep my part super concise so that Alyssa can talk about hers and hers is, I think, a lot more interesting. Um, but so the STRAC, I think you guys have had a presentation about the STRAC in the past. Um, but just as a reminder, or for those of you that don't know, um, it's Colorado Statewide Traffic Records Advisory Committee. It's made up of seven different agencies, state agencies. Those are the, the leadership. Um, and it's about improving data records. Um, and there are other agencies that are part of it as well and organizations. Anyone who is interested in traffic and safety um, is welcome to participate in the STRAC. Uh, the primary goal is really to improve those traffic records, um, timeliness, accuracy, completeness, uniformity, integration, and accessibility. Um, and it's to be used in deci for decision makers so that we can reduce transportation system fatalities and serious injuries. Um, that's kind of what they're all about. Um, so the Crash Manual Task Force, it started, uh, I wanna say back in 2022 is when we kind of first 
had inklings of, hmm, there's some stuff going on with how the DR3447 is being filled out. Um, and we thought that there was some opportunity to clarify the purpose of the manual itself. Um, obviously, a lot of work went into creating that crash form. That crash form is not changing anytime soon. Um, but we can definitely find the areas that are not coming quite coming back quite well on the back end with the data analysts. And Alyssa will talk about that a little bit, um, as well as some of those things that you guys talked about in the panel that law enforcement officers are struggling with or doing a little bit differently. So we put together a task force made up of subject matter experts so that we could just collaborate on what is the best way to do this, what was the intent of this, and then deliver some uniform messaging. Um, so really the goal is just simplify as much as possible so that it's easy for law enforcement officers to fill this out and we can get the best possible crash data at the back end so that we can help with those decision making and make everything, keep everyone safe as possible. Um, so like I said, we have STRAC representatives on that task force. We've got CDOT, DOR, Colorado State Patrol, local law enforcement agencies, and Dr. Cog is part of it as well. Um, they started by creating a user survey and that survey helped us identify what areas we needed to focus on. And I'll talk about those here in a little bit. Um, and we also held one-on-one -on -one meetings. So kind of get more in depth as to what were the challenges that all the law enforcement agencies were, or select few law enforcement agencies were seeing. Um, and then again, as I said before, it's just about making this as easy as possible. We know that you guys have as law enforcement, um, officers, you have a lot of things that you're doing. And so trying to make this just as streamlined as easy and easy for you guys. Um, so the topics that were identified were- Hold on, are, Celeste, are, are you presenting? Yes. <laughs> I'm still seeing Eric's. Oh. I am so I'm confused. Sorry. I'm trying, yeah. I, on my <laughs> side of the screen, it looks like I turned my sharing off and I'm trying to fix that because I've been told that my screen is still up. So I don't know what is the issue because it's not showing me, like I said before, I don't have a, win a banner on my window on my screen. And Wait, when I click on screen share, me, it says, let me what, see what do I want to share? I so can, I'm trying to fix that. I could potentially share what your document though, Celeste, if that makes <laughs> this better. <laughs> I thought I was being bamboozled. <laughs> no, it's a tech issue I'm trying to, trying to fix. Sorry, sorry about that. No, you're good. <laughs> Well, it's just a conversation. It's fine. <laughs> um, oh, so I'm screen sharing now. Does it let you? Stop sharing. Okay. Let's see. No, it still says I'm okay. Now I see your desktop, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> let me see if I can try sharing again on my end. Is that, did that work? No. Let's see. Oh, uh, so if you go up to the top where, and I think we everybody may have to do this, uh, where you see view options, you can see that there's, you click that and then under shared screens, there's Eric and then there's Celeste. If you click on her name, then it'll go to her presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. Let me know if, if you guys need help with that. I can type it out in the chat. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Matt, for putting that in. Just when you think you have Zoom figured out, right, there's always something. <laughs> it's not a glitch. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for helping with that. I'm trying to do one other workaround, but hopefully that solution works for everybody. All right, so some of the topics that uh, the task force decided to focus on was number one, crash location, which you guys talked a little bit about earlier. Um, secondary crash, vehicle type and special function, amended reports, narrative, and harmful event. Um, we did also talk about impairment since you guys discussed that a little bit earlier. Um, instead of creating videos, <laughs> For that one, we decided to just kind of change the language in the manual to um, hopefully empower officers to 
feel like it's okay to report on their opinion because I think that was part of the reluctance when filling that particular part out. Um, but like Sergeant Farr said earlier, right? If there's evidence that you're seeing, it, it's okay for you to put in your officer opinion. That's what it says it is. Um, although I know that there are still some, is, there's still some reluctance for that. Um, yeah, so we also created a hyperlinked manual for easy navigation. I think that one was shared amongst the task force members. I don't think it's widely out there, but if you want to see it and play with it, let me know and I can send it to you. That's kind of like an interim thing that we were working on, but you can you can go to like the form pages themselves and click on each of those fields and it'll take you directly to um to the description of what that's supposed to be and then we have other links at the very bottom to take you back to those pages. So you're using the form as opposed to the entire manual, which is very long. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alyssa. Thanks. So um, hopefully everybody can see this. I'm sorry, they're a little bit small. Um, so these two graphs are really looking at the work that the crash coders do. So these are the people that CDOT contracts um, we have six of them right now um, to process the crash data. This is just looking at um, blank fields to populated fields. So with the location, it was um, typically it was either location two was missing. So like the reference location, um, lat long population, uh, road location, and then road description were the four uh, main location uh, pieces of data that we look at. Um, so you can see that between FY23 on the left and FY24 on the right, while we did have to still, like in 23, we had to improve 21% um, of the crash reports. Uh, so that ended up being, uh, I believe, just over 20,000 records. Um, but in FY24, there was only 17% that we ended up having to add uh, the fee, add the lat long to. This does not include updating inaccurate ones. Um, unfortunately, our system is not robust enough because we are not Google um, to be able to track changes. So like if there was um, a lat long that was incorrect and we updated it, I have no way to track that. Um, but we had to make a lot less changes in FY24 because, Les, could you go to the next slide for me? I have been working relentlessly with, uh, mainly Tyler Tech has been my, pro my biggest problem child. They work with um, CSPD, Broomfield PD, Garfield County, Grand Junction, and one other that I can't pick up off the top of my head. Um, and Vinny over at DOR um, to help improve the data coming through. So a lot of these issues were due to differences in uh, field translation. So like uh, Colorado Springs had no crashes that were between 12.01 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. And that was because it was initially being uh, in put in in military time uh, but when it got transferred to DOR, it was specifically looking for AM, PM and didn't know what to do with it. Um, and so it would just like kind of called it to be, you know, the AM. Um, let's see, other instances are GPS coordinates uh, that end up being in degrees, minutes, seconds versus decimal degrees. Um, and in one case, uh, particularly with Colorado Springs PD, we were receiving narratives that included uh, lots of PII in it, and it turned out they were sending the investigative portion, so like all the witness statements and things like that, instead of the description of the crash. So in this graph, you can kind of see um, FY23 is uh, on the left in the blue, and FY24 is on the green, or in the green on the right. Um, in one year alone, um, we were able to improve the lat long population by almost 10%. Um, so that is going, that is 10% more records were populated 
uh, without our intervention. Um, and that's amazing. Um, the difference in uh, the road location and the road description means that less than 1% or less than 2% of both of those fields, I think it's like 1.55% and like 1.04% are missing. Um, so that's a huge improvement. Um, location fields are also closing that gap. Um, a lot of that has also been attributed to how the record management system was transferring things um, in what's called the XML file. Um, so it's been it's been really, really helpful uh, to work with the record management systems directly, especially uh, when they represent so many agencies um, across the state. So by tackling Tyler Tech in particular, we were able to address a lot of issues across a bunch of different agencies. So if you have a particular issue with your system or a feature that you don't like, I am happy to help you get the help that you need because you are paying for their service and you deserve to have it work in a way that it works for you. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, um, feel free to let me know. Also, I'm going to drop a link in the chat to the Crash Data website. Um, everybody's welcome to sign up for our newsletter there, which tells you about when we upload data. It also has my contact information on there. So if you want to reach out to me with any questions, um, you'll be able to drop me a line there. Um, so we have a preview of one of the training videos that we have created thus far. They are not published yet. We're working on accessibility. Once we get closed captioning in there, then um, CDOT will be able to post them on their website. However, if you want a link to all the videos, I do have, we have four total. Um, I do have those and I can send them to you. They currently live in um, Vimeo. So Eric, do you think we have, I think this one's like four minutes long. Is that okay? Or do you want me to go to the shorter one? Um. I think that's okay. Um, is do you think we are planning on posting this to our website? And so, is there any sort of um, concern with that accessibility element if it's not fully remediated on your side yet? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's only if it goes on CDOT's website. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Also, then I will. Um, oh, oh go ahead. sorry, Celeste. You may have to reshare to specifically share audio. Yeah. Let's try it and see how it goes. <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Okay. <laughs> This training video will address the narrative, how it is to be uh, built, and what should be included in it, and what should not be included in that. In the revised DR 3447. I get stuck. Seven crash form. Data analysts are looking for specific information to advance safety on Colorado roadways. Problematically, some information is being included that should not be, and some information is missing. Crash narrative should not contain PII, so personally identifiable information. So information regarding, say, driver's license or people's citizens' names, um, that information should not be in the narrative. CDOT spends a lot of time cleaning narratives to try and pull out as much as they can, but if they were unable to really pull out of all of the PII, then we cannot share that crash narrative. Alyssa Heron with CDOT shares the information in the narrative helps to advance CDOT's understanding of crash patterns. Making sure that vehicles were traveling on the correct roadways in the right direction, making the right movement, so that our engineers can understand, oh, at this intersection, people are turning left when they shouldn't. And so they can, you know, ha install mitigation to help prevent those kinds of crashes. And brevity is key. Additionally, uh, some of the narratives uh, got very long-winded, and they were unnecessarily long. And so we've uh, defined the narrative as, as really having three parts to it. First, officers need to set the stage. That is the cars on approach, whether that's on a road, a highway, approaching a light, signalized intersection, or some other control. Then crash the cars. Describe that one ran a red light or a stop sign, if that's known, and then bring the cars to rest. And quite frankly, that's where we should end the narrative. Let's look at three reports of the same crash to determine exactly what analysts are looking for in the narrative. Traffic unit number one was driving next to traffic unit number two. Traffic unit one tried to merge to the ramp to exit. They entered traffic unit two's lane and sideswiped them. 
This is considered a good narrative, but only states the mechanics of the crash. Same crash, more information. Traffic unit number one was driving northbound next to traffic unit number two south of Dry Creek. Traffic unit number one tried to merge to the ramp to exit. They entered traffic unit number two's lane and sideswiped them. This is a better narrative as it provides the mechanics, the direction, and the location of the crash. This narrative, same crash, is rated as the best and preferred. Traffic unit number one was driving northbound next to traffic unit number two south of Dry Creek. Traffic unit number one tried to merge to the ramp to exit. Traffic unit number one did not ensure the lane was clear. Enter traffic yep. unit number two's lane and sideswipe. Crash not only includes the mechanics, the direction, and the location, but also the cause. Notice in none of the scenarios PII is mentioned. Additionally, law enforcement officers need to pay extra attention when a juvenile is involved in a crash. The courts now recognize that a traffic crash report is a criminal record. For this reason, it must be uh, quick and easy to redact juvenile names from the report. How do we do that? Simply by only putting the name where it's asked for. This information belongs in the officer's statement where protected information can remain protected. When we're processing 100,000 crashes a year, it's, it's difficult for my team to be able to scrape all that data out, so it's just best if it's never there to begin with. <laughs> for more information on the narrative, visit the Investigating Officer's Crash Reporting Manual. That's all we had for you guys today. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think you guys have Alyssa's email. My screen share messed up there, so I can put that information back up, or I think um, it can get sent out after by Eric. Um, I do have just one small little thing to say too, because I would be remiss if I don't mention this, but there are 405C funds out there to improve um, traffic data. So if you have any any need for, for funds, please reach out and we will work on ways to, to see if we can get those funds over to you guys. Um, it's all managed through, through CDOT, but there are federal funds. Um, and we just have to have like a performance measure associated with, and we can help you figure that component of it out. Um, so let me know if you need more information on that. And thank you guys so much. All right, great. Thank you so much, Celeste and Alyssa. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen again. I know we have a few minutes left. Um, we're at the end and hopefully this works right. OK, this is looking better than the first time already. Great. So really, just to bring around out the meeting, um, as far as next steps, um, as I mentioned earlier in the timeline, we are going to be having one another meeting in September. Um, dates to be determined, but likely the, I don't want to say likely, but probably towards the end of the month. Um, we are working on our final report, again, which includes our specific outcomes, recommendations, and next steps that we want to share really addressing the primary goals, investigating and demonstrating the value of a consortium, and working to solve common issues with crash data processing and analysis. And like I mentioned, doing a sort of a year-end survey, um, and we're still working through what that's going to look like, but I would expect to see that from us probably in late July or early August, um, probably late July though. Since we do have, since we do have a quick minute, um, one last thing, I shared this at the last meeting at the end and I want to invite um, anyone here to go to mentee.com and enter this code or use their QR code to scan this. It's just a really one question open-ended. Um, we want to make this space useful for everybody. And so really the goal is to this is a question asking about what you would like to see in future meetings, um, future work of this group. Um, a lot of this has been driven by individual conversations and small, small, small e emails back and forth, but trying to make sure that this, these meetings are useful for everyone. Um, as I said, this hey, is where Eric. we got the. Oh yes, I'm, I'm sorry. See um, I'm not seeing a screen share. Oh, I, I I'm struggling today. Apparently, thank you. 
Thanks. That's Thank great. you, Jenny. <laughs> All right. So this has a QR code associated with it. Um, or if you go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, enter the code um, 91402579. Um, just any open-ended ideas on um, what's... Are folks able to see this? Yes. Okay. I'm going to move back to the instructions. Um, some comments we had last time, again, relating to law enforcement, like we talked about today. Um, others we had coming in about maybe what types of um, software are used, what types of visions, how these crash data is used for Vision Zero plans, um, what other states or regions are doing. And so I th we're going to try to work, work these into um, future meetings of this, even though we are wrapping up our 405C program here in um, September, um, Dr. Cog is intending to continue on with, um, with this work. And so we want to make sure and just make sure that this is useful for you all. So I'm gonna advance this to this next slide. And again, open-ended, um, just go ahead and let us know what you think, but uh, of course, I'm always available for conversations or emails back and forth. So if you would prefer to just write me an email um, or get in touch with me through that way, um, just please let me know. And we'll leave this open for a while. And if anyone has any questions, um, again, I'm always available to, to speak with you. Okay, we've got a couple um, traffic engineers discussing crashes alongside traffic enforcement officers. Um, I like today's panel, um, a dashboard of the work in progress. Um, officer training information, possibility of statewide training for key supervisors. Yeah, that's a great idea. I know the Federal Highway, Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, um, has recently done a small group with some of the local local jurisdictions in the area talking about some of these issues. Um, and I think that that is a really great step in the right direction. And that's again, definitely something that we could look at doing here in this space as well. All right. All right, well, we are at time. So I'm just gonna go to the very last slide I have, which I think it's just come my email. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I hope that you all enjoyed the conversations we had with our our law enforcement guests, as well as our guests from Stolfus Associates and the Department of Transportation. Again, any questions or you ever want to talk or, or about the progress on this, any ideas moving forward, um, just please reach out to me directly. I'm always happy to set up a call or meet. And um, thank you all for joining today. I'll leave it open for a few moments. Thank you. Thank you.